So this particular shelter takes a lot of poles and it's not an overnight type of thing. I mean, I guess you could if you wanted, but I wouldn't want to do it overnight. This is more of like a semi, like a longer term type shelter that I'm going to build. It requires that I construct three tripods, a couple of really long poles. So it's a lot of sawing. And of course, anytime I saw, especially out here, I don't really have time. I could build, you know, a bucking station to where I can do this a lot more efficiently. But since I'm going out and retrieving it from the forest, I'll just use a simple plumber's vise to use my saw safely. So when I come up to a piece like this, I want to cut some length off of it. All I have to do is with my dominant leg, step over it. And then I'm going to kind of squat down. And as I squat down, I'm going to tuck that up behind kind of the crook of my knee on my dominant side. And then my thigh right here is going to support the piece from underneath. And that locks it into position really tight, really stable. And allows me to cut everything to the outside of my triangle of death here. So, that's a really efficient and solid way to do it. Then I can simply close my saw for all you haters. Pull it through a little bit more, lock it back down, and I'm ready to saw off the next length that I want. So I've got a lot of sawing to do, so you can bear with me for those. Couple more. So I got my first three poles and what I'm going to do for these three poles, these are, you know, probably six or seven feet long. They're fairly equal in length. What I'm going to do is a three pole shear lash here because I want to actually have this tighten up with the shearing motion. So I'm going to kind of tie this, lash it together really quick and uh, use this as part of the structure for this particular shelter. So whenever I'm putting a tripod together, and, and keep in mind, I'm not doing a traditional tripod lash. This is a three pole shear lash. Uh, they work differently, they're tied differently. It's really important that the ends that are gonna be on the ground are actually even, more so than up top. So I wanna get those roughly even. And that looks pretty good. And I like to set mine kind of up off of the ground because I'm gonna be tying and bringing cordage in and out, uh, and that just makes it easier. So that's what I like to do. I'm gonna take this, this is probably a 30 foot hank of paracord. I probably won't need all of that. And I'm gonna show you how to do this one, this first one with paracord, just because it's easier to see. But I'll probably do the other one with uh, number 36 bank line, because that's what I have on me. And any of these cordages are gonna work, so. For my three pole shear lash, I like to start them with a timber hitch. And for the timber hitch, nothing more than, you know, creating a bite and then kind of pinching that. And then I'll stick my finger in there and give it about, I don't know, five to seven twists. So that it kind of binds up on itself a little bit. And then I'll kind of capture that. I've still got all those twists that are creating friction. I'll find the other end. And then I'll go through that loop that I made. So what I've done, I'll show you that really quickly before I put it on the actual poles. What I've done is created a slip knot and it has a bunch of twists on it here so that as I tighten it down, it actually puts that friction and kind of locks that down. And that's what creates that timber hitch that I'm looking for. It'll hold it on the pole that I put it on, all right? Now I'm just gonna slide that on here. And I'll probably put it 
about eight inches down to start and I'll pull tension back against that, okay? And that locks it into place. And the timber hitch is a really cool hitch. You could use a clove hitch here, um, but you know, the timber hitch is a little more versatile than the clove hitch in my opinion. It's really good uh, for making a quick self-tightening hitch. I guess it's not really self-tightening because you have to tighten it, but it's a, a tension, uh, it's locked by tension. So it's, it's tension dependent. Um, but it's really good for what they used to use it for is, is when you're dragging timber out of the forest, you know, by horse or mule, uh, you could quickly wrap that timber hitch around the end of it and you could pull it out. And then once you got it out, then you could easily untie it and put it onto the next log. So that's why it's called the timber hitch. Uh, but I like to use it to start these because it locks on there nice and positive. Now from there, I'm gonna do probably four to six wraps from here towards the ends. And by wraps, I just mean coming around the entire thing. I wanna keep it all nice and tight. But when you're doing shear lashes, understand that the shearing action of opening this tripod or opening a bipod if you're doing a two pole shear lash is what actually tightens it up the most. So don't get too crazy with making this portion of it tight or you'll never be able to open them. That's about four wraps. We'll call that five. And we'll do one more for good measure. I usually don't like to count the first one because it has the knot on it. So now I've got the original knot plus one, two, three, four, five, six wraps. All right, and I've kept those nice and stacked together, keeps them tight because anytime you're doing any type of a lashing, you know, that space is gonna equal looseness later on. So once I've gone around, now I need to put in frapping turns and a frapping turn basically pulls all those wraps together to make it tight. And you can see how much looseness I've got there just by the irregularity of that. That's all gonna be pulled together. So all I have to do is change direction. So I'm gonna continue around the bottom now I'm gonna come up through that set, and now I'm going perpendicular to those wraps. Find my other end, because it's easier to feed it through that way, kind of like threading a needle. Here we go. And when I pull tension on that, it really locks those wraps in place. So I'll usually do two to three frapping turns on each part of it. And as I do it, what you can do is you can hand tighten it if you get a good grip, but if you can't get a good grip, just use a tent stake or a toggle to make what's called a frapping stick. All you have to do is wrap around it a couple of times to give yourself a handle, and then you can really pull the tension out of it that way. And it's easy to take off. So if you feel like you need that little extra oomph in there, recommend a frapping stick. I'm gonna go through here one more time. Try to manage my cordage so I don't get any tangles or knots. And pull that tight. Mosquitoes are out, I can hear them. Usually when I start hearing the mosquitoes, that means it's time to hurry up and get your shelter done. Now I've got my two fraps that are locking that in. Now I need to frap this portion between these two poles. So I'll just continue around. And of course, I've got to change direction. A little knot there, so I'm gonna thread the needle again. get my cordage going the direction I need it to go. I've gone over, I'm gonna come around. And then continue to wrap, or I should say wrap, wrap the wraps, not wrap the wraps, you're gonna wrap them.
and back up through. Get my frapping stick because this is a pretty large space right here. So I want to get some of that slack out of there. And then I'll put in my second frapping turn. Pretty good. I've got a lot of extra on here. And in, for cordage management, you know, I don't have to cut this off unless I need this for something else. So I could just leave it there. But, you know, to kind of keep this neat and I may need this cordage for something else, I'm gonna give myself a couple of feet to work with. I got my knife and, you know, for knife grips, like safe knife grips, typically you have a forehand grip and then you have a, or a forward grip, and then you have a reverse grip. And typically you're never gonna use a reverse grip except for this thing right here. All right, when you pull cordage, you can either use a forward grip and cut away from yourself, or if someone's in proximity of you, it's courteous to use a reverse grip and actually not cut towards them either. So that's one of the main things you'll use that for. It's not a very common grip but that's what it's for. Now I've got myself a little bit of slack. I'm gonna come over and create a loop. And then that loop forms the beginning of my clove hitch. I'm gonna come back around and basically put another half hitch in by going underneath. Tighten that all down. And then I'll secure that with an overhand stopper so it doesn't come out. If you want to take the time to burn the ends, you can do that. But I started with a timber hitch, four to six wraps, two to three fraps each, finish it with a clove hitch, and then you've got your tripod. From here, you've got to stand it up and when you actually shear it apart, that's when you're going to get that tightening of everything and it's going to make a really nice tight joint right here. All right, I'm going to set this up right over here. It'll probably go about right there, but all you have to do is shear this open. Turn this a little this way. All right, so all you have to do is spread this out, get it about where you want it. This is your stabilizer leg towards the back. Nice and stable, and that shearing action actually tightens this up really nicely. And of course, you've got to test every tripod you make by testing to see if it can hold weight. That dog will hunt right there. Mm -hmm. One more of these. Cutting the other poles for the tripod just happened to find a really good piece of cedar that I'm going to use for the tripod. But if you look at this cedar, it's just got this perfect outer bark, which is one of my favorite things about the cedar is so good for tinder and a number of other things, uh, but this tinder is a little too valuable to leave on a tripod. So I'm gonna take a little time before I use it for construction and I'm gonna shave off everything it's gonna give me here and put that inside my tinder pouch here because it's more valuable to me as a fire resource than just hanging out, making my tripod look a little more rustic. 
So I'm gonna shave that down. I've got this tripod up, so I'm gonna use that to my advantage. Put that in there. I think I'll use the spine of my silky saw and it's got a really good sharp 90 degree spine. Really easy for getting this bark off. And just kind of catch it as it comes down. I could probably get an entire tinder bundle off of this. That's just really nice, fluffy tinder. So I got these poles. These poles need to be four inches or so in diameter because I got to support my body weight during the night. And that may or may not be, you know, 200 pounds plus, you know, it's not polite to ask, but uh, they need to be pretty structurally sound because you're going to be putting all your body weight on this. Uh, so that's really a key component to this. And they're probably, I would say 12 to 14 feet long, really depends on how long you really put your bases out. Uh, so obviously you have a larger diameter in the fat end and then you have the skinny end what i want to do is i drug them both in here this way but i need to actually offset those i want you know fat ends opposing skinny ends opposing and uh you know that kind of evens it out and makes it more even when i put my bed sleeve on all right rolling that's camera b isn't it uh that is camera a in this case because it's the primary it's on sticks can't work under these conditions so for my bedding, I'm actually going to use my John Pack bed sleeve and you know, I've used it for a number of things, but it's designed to have three different functions. Okay. You could use it as a browse bed by stuffing it with uh, debris. You can also use it how I'm going to use it on this uh, raised bed. And you could also make a hammock out of it. It does have reinforced grommets. So in this case, I'm going to use it on this raised bed to give me a platform uh, to sleep on. And it's a really, really versatile piece of gear. It's just a piece of canvas sewn into a sleeve with reinforced grommets really cool from John Pack so that's what I'm going to use swagger all right We got those about even, maybe a little bit back this way. Now, if you have a partner, this is really easy, but if you don't, it's not so easy, but you just gotta kinda get it up there. getting somewhere we're taking fire and of course I want these ends to be even so I got to slide this whole thing a little bit
That looks pretty good. Now with this, the way this works, this sleeve can only expand so far. So it doesn't allow your cross members to spread further than the bases of your tripod. So if that angle looks a little too steep and looks like it could slip, all you have to do is widen the base of your tripod. But this doesn't look too bad. As you widen that base, you have to also realize that you're raising the height. So if this is too high, then again, decreasing the size of that base is gonna make it more steep so that you can bring those closer together and they'll actually go further down, closer to the ground. Number one rule of a hammock or an improvised type hammock or raised bed in this case is never put it higher than you're willing to fall. I'm willing to fall this far because I have trust in my construction of this. But I am going to do it once around and make sure that everything's kind of locking in place. Looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. Nah, you almost got me. If you are having problems keeping it spread, you can also put spreader bars in there, but usually it's not necessary. I see what's happening here. A little rock making it a little hard. That's pretty good. All right. So I've got my two tripods. The weight of everything is pushing it down onto the base of that tripod, which is spreading it farther. As it spreads, that tightens this down and actually locks everything into place. If you're not comfortable with that, you can always lash those sides. But most of the time, these are pretty stable as long as you got everything together, but you still gotta test it. So when you get on these, you know, you need equal tension on both sides. And you can't get on one side or the other because all that weight will push everything this way and it'll flip down. You've gotta kind of hold tension on both sides as you evenly place your body on here a little slippery in the back. I'm gonna fix that. That could have been disastrous. That feels better. You only live once. Even tension. Set up on here. Get right inside. Oh. Yeah. Not gonna lie, it's pretty nice. She was a little sketchy there for a second. I'm like, woo, we're going down. I was, I was over here. I was, I was, uh, you were hoping. Giddy. I was like, we're going to get a fall on camera. You were hoping. But no. Of course, I still got to get out of it. It's still rolling. There's still hope. It could happen. And I ain't looking back. 